I'm Angelo John Lewis for the Sacred Inclusion Network, and um, most of you are a little bit familiar with us, but um, you can learn more about us by going to our website, <laughs> sacredinclusion.com. And um, we're just delighted to have you here. I've been looking forward to this uh, for a little while. I'm, I'm um, a big fan of Ryan Hurd. And um, before I tell you a little bit about him um, and we get started, I'm going to ask um, my um, colleague, um, Ian, to lead us in a little invocation or affirmation or whatever we want to call it, and then we'll get started. All right. Uh, hello, everybody, for being here. So, um, yeah, I think we can just take a moment and recognize the beauty of our breath and the beauty of our moment, of the moment. And so I um, ask of you to just close your eyes and get grounded in your seat. So feel your butt in your seat. Feel your feet on the ground. And just give a hello to your body, you know, let it know that you're consciously thinking about it and um, and give it a quick scan. I'm not going to give you too much directions, but um, yeah, just give some love to your body. So I'll give us about 20 seconds to say hello to our body. All right, so now I want us to get a little acquainted with our breath. So I would like for us to take a deep breath through our nose with our mouths closed for as long as we can. And then once we get to the end point, hold for four seconds and then take a long, slow exhale. And we can just repeat that a few times. So if we wanna do it, take a deep breath in through our nose, And then just let it out as slow as you like. And I'm going to um, allow you to do that three more times at your own leisure. Um, all right, for a second, I wasn't sure if I froze or not. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I just want to thank you all for being here. And we are going to sit and listen to Ryan tell us about lucid dreaming. He's a dream researcher, and I'm very interested and excited for what comes next. So, unless yeah, you have something to say, Angelo. Let me introduce Ryan a little bit. Um, all right. Um, I will say on a, a sort of personal note, I met Ryan, I don't know how many years ago, Ryan, was it like 10 years ago, something like that? Mm, yeah. 13. 13, you remember, my God, <laughs> yeah. And we were doing um, a Mankind Project um, thing, and that's where we met, and we stayed in touch, and I've been um, following his career ever since and getting to know him a little bit. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the formal aspect of Ryan. Uh, this young man has an MA in Consciousness Studies and a Certificate of Dream Studies. He also holds a BA degree specializing in archaeology. He spent the better part of a decade evacuating ruins in North America before turning inward to the riches of the mind. And um, he's done a lot of things. He's been a spiritual director for a Unitarian church. He um, runs the um, dreamstudies.org website. He's been involved seriously in dreams for at least 10 or 15 years. Um, he's probably one of the preeminent um, experts, not academic experts, in actually in nightmares, which is a sort of subspecialty of Ryan. But in any event, um, welcome, um, Ryan. Um, welcome to our network. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for that warm introduction. It's great to be here with y'all today. And um, so this is an exploration. And I do have a formal presentation that I'm going to share um, at some point, but we're also going to do some activities together. And there's going to be some time for discussion uh, as well. I'd love to... Um, yeah, make this interactive and, and especially because we have a nice core group here, I think this will make it kind of easy to do so, right? So um, I know that some of y'all have your um, cameras off. I know Fur doesn't have a camera. Um, and so we could use chat for this too. Um, but I'm just curious about how many, if you consider yourself to be a dreamer, do you remember your dreams? Do you track your dreams? Thanks. Perfect. Nice. Thanks. I appreciate it. I've got to plug a computer in here while y'all put these chats in. <laughs> nice. I have it tattooed. <laughs> Creative dreams when I'm artistic more so. Yeah, right. Great. So, so dreaming uh, is an active part of your creative life. Yeah, that's lovely. That's lovely. I and I consider that too. Anyone else want to share about, uh, yeah, your relationship to dreams? Um, I saw Walter and Bill put their hands up, and I believe Jamie might have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, Walter. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I'm 81 years old, and I'm uh, finding that my dreams coming very short and quick. And so there will be maybe one dream uh, of the night that will stick out for me. Uh, but I'm finding that uh, I'm just uh, not remembering as much as I did even two or three years ago. Hmm. Interesting. Thanks for sharing mm -hmm. that. Yes, yeah, some of the things we can talk about today can be about ways to um, increase dream recall, mm -hmm. uh, which really works uh, for any age. Cool. So I can say that um, I, I get in contact with my you know subconscious mind through the dreams. And what I like about it is that um, after I've had uh, dreams which you know border on nightmares um then then it's 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 really much clearer to me what the feeling is you know that what's going on that i'm usually not in contact with and then then by uh, then i can start associating with that and it brings up more so i feel like it's it's a good way for me to get into the side of myself which you know is still relatively hidden Oh yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, it's it's sort of like a rolling ball, isn't it? Um, you start to remember a little bit of dreams. It gives you a little bit of a, a glimmer to something, and then some insight can come. Thinking about that can bring more dreams, um, more insight. There's there's a really interesting tuning effect that happens uh, when we start paying attention to our dreams. Yeah, I I um I guess I could chime on a little bit. I'll add on to Bill. Um, you know, I remember my dreams. Um, I would say, well, I don't know. That's not true. I, I, I remember a dream, uh, maybe 70% of the time, you know, but the honest, the honest truth is I don't really know what to do with them. You know, sometimes I try to decipher <laughs> them and, um, uh, you know, I know intellectually that, um, it, it might be better to just sort of meet the dream on its own terms. I don't really know what to do with that. I do have some experience with uh, with um, lucid dreams. I've, I had a very, um, I mean, I call it very impactful um, experience where, um, you know, which I won't spend a lot of time talking about. So I know that lucid dreaming is a thing, that it's real. And I would love to get more adept at it. And um, I bought your course, Ryan, and I'm hoping that that will assist me. Nice. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, we can. So we'll we'll talk about lucid dreaming as well in uh, today. And so just to define lucid dreaming as that's the 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 practice of 
the moment of when you're dreaming, you realize that you're dreaming and you have this, this moment of, oh, aha, like this is a dream. I'm in a dream right now, which can open up just sort of so much new opportunities. Uh, the way I think about it is opportunities for choice making, really. We're able to make decisions and even go against the grain of our habitual responses, our habitual mind, so we can really move deeper um, um, with safety and, and feeling secure into, into spaces that maybe we wouldn't have done had we not been lucid. Uh, so it's a way of, of moving with the dream, of meeting the dream halfway. That's something that you were just said, Angelo, in a different context, but that's the way that I practice lucid dreaming as well not as a way to control my dreams, but rather to control my attention, my focus, um, and basically to begin a dial a dialogue with the dream. But even if, you know, and I'm noticing that um that Fur put into the into the chat that um she's in a period of not remembering dreams right now. Um and so I want to give just a brief, like I can do a brief little piece on on dreams and dream work in general before I kind of we move deeper, which is that it's totally fine and normal to go through periods of not remembering dreams. Um, and what the research shows us is that dreams function regardless if we remember them or not. Um, and because there's plenty of folks that don't remember their dreams and are healthy. And so, and so we know that, that, that this is, we can see this as a bonus effect. However, I do think that looking at the anthropology of consciousness, looking at cultures that value dreams, work with dreams, that there's a lot of things that essentially unlock with self-understanding as well as information um, transfer in community processes that unlock when folks do remember their dreams and talk about their dreams and share them together. And so we happen to live in a culture that doesn't appreciate dreams. I mean, we don't even appreciate sleep, right? <laughs> you know, you kind of like look at really what's even undergirding all of that is we live in a society that doesn't sleep, um, that doesn't consider sleep to be a part of wellness or health. Um, and yet sleep is so key to almost everything else that's going on in our lives. And so it's almost like a double whammy when it comes to dreams because sleep's not respected. Dreaming is ignored and misunderstood. And so, so it's a, it's a big jump, right? To go from, Hey, dreams are actually powerful and potent and have all this information for us and then even further jump to say oh well i can become self-aware of my dreams and i can ask for i can ask questions of my dreams and, and i think we <laughs> right we're we're just like jumping paradigms here so quickly and so to, to take this back on us is just to realize that that it's okay to go through fluctuations and when we put the wrong kind of pressure on ourselves to remember dreams or even to try to have a lucid dream, that can be um, not effective. And so, and so take a slow approach and be curious about your nightlife when it works for the rest of your days. And so like, is this a good time to um, in your life to be able to focus on what's happening for me in my sleep? Do I have time to write my dreams down? Do I have time to do, say, do some intentional exercises in the night, right? And just like basically make a cut. Is this a good time to do this work? And if you're super stressed out or you're moving homes or, uh, right, really, you know, these are times that you just, you can let all that kind of stuff go. Uh, and, and the dreams will come back when we have space for them because we have our whole lives to dream, right? So, um, and they're just cooking along without us anyway. Uh, so so that's the, that's the piece about, about dreaming. And then the, I had mentioned about when, um, in response to Bill, how there's this, this thing that happens with when we 
start to rem think about our dreams, remember our dreams, that there's a tuning effect that occurs. And this tuning effect is really phenomenal and it happens quickly. And so you can say, I'm a person who very rarely remembers my dream, but even by having this conversation, you already are likely to remember a dream tonight because you brought the dreaming into your, into your conscious space. So, so when we make room for it socially, when we share our dreams, when we start being curious about what we're experiencing, even if we don't understand it, that's fine. Like try to, you know, like live in that mystery and don't be afraid of that unknowing. Um, I think we often try too hard to, um, right, to analyze and deconstruct and um, figure out, hey, what does this symbol mean? Uh, there's a lot of assumptions in that when it comes to dreams that I, I feel like we should just like, hey, slow down, just appreciate your dreams, see what's coming through, laugh with them, um, be curious about them, ask, you know, what is this dream bringing up that I didn't already know? Or maybe it's something that I knew, but I shoved aside because it's inconvenient or it's a hard truth. Um, it's, you know, it's edgy perhaps. Um, or it's just too weird and I can't handle the weirdness factor um, because not everything that we dream is true. And I say this, it sounds obvious when I say it like that, but we hold multiple paradigms about dreams, even in if we don't have a lot of information about dreams and we go back to, oh, if I dream that somebody dies, that means they're going to die. If I dream that I'm hurt, it means that I have cancer we we tend to become very literalistic very quickly about dreams and when dreams are really when you look at the data when you look at the research dreams are about possibilities they're about past present and future possibilities and so and this can be quite playful as well as serious and so yeah some like angsty stuff can come up and it's even possible that some stuff from childhood that could be even traumatic can come up. But at the same time, yeah. it's coming up in a way that might be, that is in a form that is bite-sized and that we can play with and that we can entertain because a dream is essentially, it's like a safe space, essentially. Um, and so not everything that we dream is about deep trauma. Not everything that we dream is a deep message from um, the higher self or however you say it. Um, although we do get also some really interesting, you know, I'd say information downloads that come that are um, intriguing, right? And I think that's what makes dreams kind of interesting is, is that you can move very quickly from little dreams, like the dreams that I have every day that are say about, oh, I'm still dreaming about high school, even though I haven't been in high school for 30 years. Like I literally had a high school locker dream like a month ago, like trying to remember my locker combination. <laughs> like what, why, you know, why? And then at the same, at the same time, we can have a big dream, a dream that comes through that is challenging, that perhaps brings spiritual insight or spiritual experience, actual lived spiritual experience, like energetic kundalini rising experiences, non-duality, um, ancestral visitations, um, experiences of divine love, experiences of existential loss, Right. And so we can move into these into these non-ordinary spaces through dreaming also. And so there's big dreams and there's little dreams. Right. Um, I, I just want to um, put out to y'all. Have you all had ever had a big dream? However, you define it, a, a dream that has impacted mm -hmm. you and that you think about and that it could have been years ago or. You know, I mean. Most folks I know, even if they don't have dream recall, there seems to be one or two dreams that stick with us, kind of that they stick, they stick to our bones. Um, nice. I have dreams that are like movies. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah, and, you know, and we have, and this is one more thing I can say about dreams is that we all have personal styles about the way that we dream. And so the way, I, I don't dream in a particularly cinematic fashion. Um, uh, but then look at the dreams of, say, Carl Jung, who is like always dreaming, you know, the psychologist, he's always dreaming about fiery archetypes and, you know, mythological creatures and, you know, potent symbolic images that are clear and like i don't dream like that either you know uh i mean how amazing that would be you know like i said i'm back in high school trying to figure out my locker combination most of the time apparently <laughs> so we work with what we've got you know and it's just and so the, the continuum piece here is is that our dreaming mind is a, is a continuation of our creative mind it's our intuitive creative mind that's in a very nice container um, and we're working through the stuff that's most important to us. And so if you're thinking about something hard, it could be a work, it could be relationship. Um, you know, it needs, you know, that's what we're going to be dreaming about. We dream about what's important to us. Uh, and then with the bizarreness that kicks in, but, um, we can learn a lot from looking at dream dream reports of people without having to interpret it. We can look at dream reports and say, well, this person uh, probably has cats. They're probably a Republican. They probably grew up in um, California because they're always dreaming about this. Stuff. It's interesting how many you know um, inferences researchers can make just by looking at people's dreams, not interpreting them, just looking at what shows up. And so there's all these wonderful levels and layers to dreaming in general. And I always like to start with this before launching into the topic of lucid dreaming because, because lucid, lucidity is this idea of becoming self-aware in a dream and knowing that you're dreaming. And it's important to realize that we're becoming lucid, not in a scripted, like a virtual reality, um, or, but it's, it's, it's this dynamic space of you know emotion and visual images um and patterned thoughts and so um i'm curious if um if how many here have ever had a lucid dream before and you could put it in the chat or or raise your hand if you've ever had if you think you've had a lucid dream before knowing that you're dreaming in the dream Nice. So, so I'm seeing so far about half. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks, George. Yeah. So, so great. I mean, so, and this is interesting because uh, what the research also shows is, is that lucid dreaming is actually pretty common when you look at it from a population standpoint that most people now are have thought to have had a lucid dream at least once in their life. Uh, I think it's something like 60% from some of the most recent demographic data. So it often it's when we're teenagers, when our brains are developing and we're having a lot of dream recall and then never again, but it's just a clue and a reminder that these things are possible. Uh, and, and that's what makes lucid dreaming so interesting is, is that it is a learnable skill. And so you can have a lucid dream by intending to have it and by trying some practices during the day that essentially do that tuning practice. And the practices that we do in waking life, therefore translate into our dreams. And so that's sort of the backdrop of what we'll be talking about today in terms of using amulets and uh, in, into um, into dream practices. I know want so, to ask, um, ask a question. Um, yeah. Because um, you know, as you know, a lot of dream books and research they talk about it's about dream interpretation, right? You know, there's whole libraries about you know these symbols mean this, and you know, so um, what I heard you what I heard you say explicitly. Um, is that it's really not about dream interpretation per se. Can you just talk about that whole thing? Because yeah, yeah, you know, I can I can talk about that. So, so the my paradigm is dream work and dream honoring, and you can do this without having a, a book of dream symbols, without being uh, an expert in mythology or storytelling or 
you know, archetypal mythology or anything of that nature, those skills and things can be helpful when looking at collective images, you know, images that come from a cultural or even an existential level that come through our dreams. But our dreams are also so personalized based on our own life history and our own experiences. And so just for an example, like a rose as an as a flower uh, has a lot of collective connotations, right? Um, but but a person could exper- have a, had a bad experience with a red rose. Perhaps it's related to the death of her uncle when she was young, and and so this person, a red rose, might show up as a as a, a connection, an imagery that comes up with loss, as opposed to romance or some of the you know collective connotations that we see. And so it's better to look at dreams from my perspective, from an existential perspective of the dreams are real lived moments. And even though we're in a creative fervor and, and the rational mind is sort of asleep to some degree and there's high emotionality, there's still experiences that we're moving through in time. And so to honor a dream, if you start there, honoring a dream can look very simple. You know, writing the dream down, telling the dream, sharing the dream to a loved one, sharing them in a circle of folks who appreciate dreams, but also working with dream imagery in a way, say you could incorporate it into art you could incorporate it into into language it can be inspiring in in you could for instance do a ritual you could um take something from a dream image and you know make an altar from it or or you know do some kind of enactment and so when we basically when we move dreams into our social space and into our cultural spaces what we're doing is we're taking these energies and we're working with them and, and we're digesting them and we're continuing, you know, and and so we're not like saying, what does this mean necessarily? What happens when we often, and this is the danger of dream interpretation is, is that we'll say, Oh, this dream means this thing. And we decide that's what this dream is. And then we put it on a shelf and then we never think about it again because we figured it out. Right. And, but a dream is just like any kind of thought or process that you've had in your life. Like, uh, you know, I mean, just think about uh, an inspir- an inspirational thought or an image that's come to you in waking life or um, the things that you thought about when you're eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Like, were those thoughts one thing? Did they equate to one thing? You know, there's a multiplicity that happens with our cognition with our consciousness we're taking in information we're interpreting it we're we're you know moving our attention we're avoiding things we're right we're repressing things that we don't want to see this happens in conscious life this is waking life we do this in dreams too and so and so that's the thing about dream interpretation is that if you really want to move into that space you can't just use a symbol or a symbol dictionary, you want to like, look at, oh, what's happening here in my relationships? What's happening here? Um, Yeah, how am I feeling right now? Like, how, how is the imagery transforming from the beginning of this dream to the end of this dream? There's so many different other ways to to look rather than just simply trying to um, create an equal sign for what this symbol means. And so I, I encourage people to look at dreams as moments in time, and look at the relationships, look at the feelings, and look at what's new, what has been learned, or what has come to awareness that wasn't here before. And those three or four things are enough, I think, to, to stir up our unconscious creative energy and to build these relationships with our dream life. And then what's interesting, and this is the cool part, is that over time, as we do this, our dreams become more sensible. They there's more. It's easier to make sense of our dreams, not that, just because we're 
we're honing in on some of these skills of thinking intuitively and holding multiplicity, right? But also because it seems like the dreams begin to focus in with us and they become more understandable themselves. The imagery becomes clearer and less muddy. The emotions become less like cloud cover and more like penetrative insights, right? And so and so that's dream work. And dream work can be done individually with yourself, but I also highly recommend working with other people and this is something that one of my dream teachers, Jeremy Taylor, used to say is, is that we're all uniquely blind to our own dream processes. And so it's so easy to look at someone else's dream, you know, say your spouse or your partner shares a dream and you're like, oh, yeah, like I absolutely can see some waking life reflections here. But we can't do that with our own dreams. And this is super typical. And so that's what's nice about writing dreams down too, is that we externalize it a little bit. We, you know, we create uh, something that can be viewed. And so it's not just a jumble. So, yeah, yeah. I, I'll, we, um, are there questions or what's coming up for y'all about that stuff that I just spoke about? Because um, because we can we can talk a little bit more about that before we, we go deeper. I would like to say something to you guys because dreams have been a very, very strong, powerful thing in my life. Two years before my own husband passed away, I had a dream of that very experience. So could you tell me a little bit about why that dream and and why, and why um, um, it became real. It became real. So the, the audio was a little fluttery. Um, and I wonder if what I heard was is about dreams about about your husband after he passed away. But I didn't catch if there was any more details. Hey, hey oh, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Don. Don. I'll, I'll clarify, clarify it. it. Is the is audio, audio good, good or no? Or no? Yeah, I'm you. sorry. I'm just in a very, very tight Wi-Fi pot. I can repeat, I can repeat what, Dawn what Dawn said, said if that's okay. okay. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Her, her husband, husband passed away. away. She, she actually dreamt, dreamt about, about it, and it came to life. So she wants she to know wants more about, about that. that. And oh, don't, okay. Don't, exactly. Right. Yeah. So, well, first off, I'm, I'm. I'm really um, sorry to hear about the death of your husband and my condolences, my sincere condolences for, the, for your deep loss. Dreams take us to these spaces. Um, I had mentioned that dreams are past, future, and present possibilities. And in this way, dreams often bring up these potentials. Uh, and it's powerful and unsettling when they come true, right? When a dream turns out to be essentially prophetic and it raises questions, not only about the nature of reality and the way that time works, but also about our role in, in time. For instance, what could I have done differently? Was this dream a way of trying to make a warning? Did I not heed this warning? What what if I had done something different? And so it, it, it brings all these questions of responsibility, um, which can be, frankly, kind of unfair, I think, to the dreamer, um, because we only know what we know when we know it. And it's often, and that's how we find out about prophetic dreams, of course, is, to, is we find out when they do come true. And so... I will just say this in general, that, that the more you focus on your dreams, the more these kind of things will emerge, future possibilities um, that are not random. Um, it could simply be about that we unconsciously picked up on something that we didn't consciously want to know, or it could have been a true prophetic 
time and moment where we're unstuck in time. And I've had moments of this in my own life where I can't rationally make sense of the things that, that have come through from a materialistic standpoint. And they make a believer out of you, right? At least it did for me that, that okay, we live in a more complicated universe. What does this mean? What is our role? What is our responsibility? And what I would say from a practical standpoint, Don, is that is um, the fact of the tuning in to the death of a loved one, to the death of your husband, shows a, a love and a commitment and a connectedness that moves beyond time. And that means that there is still a potential and a possibility, if it were my dream, to know that I'm still connected with this person now and can be in the future. It's what we see in repetitive dreams of, of people who are bereaved is, is that they, when they're open to it, they can have more of these kind of dreams and they can be quite uh, therapeutic because they offer us another chance to connect with a loved one. So I don't know if that resonates with you. Um, and if you'd like, you, you, it, you're yeah, welcome to, would you like to speak about it? So thank you for your words around that. The only, the only reason, reason I was, I was asked, asked is because, because that was, that was just, just one, one of the thousands of dreams that have actually come through. So uh, I, was I was kind of curious, curious as, as to how you relate, relate to, to that, that and what, what you, you think, think is service, service to humanity, humanity through, through that. that. So what is our service to humanity knowing that sometimes we dream about the future? Is that the question? Yes. Yes. Right. And so I can't, I can't answer this question, but that is the question, right? And so, and I would even say that that is the meditation and that is the challenge of living of living <laughs> yeah the world is deeper and more complicated than than we we're told to believe what is our personal role and responsibility knowing that information comes in from the future sometimes and that time doesn't move like it's supposed to and for me knowing that I can't differentiate in the moment if a dream will later turn out to be accurate or not. I have to focus on this moment right now and, and try to do my best to be open to those who I'm in relationship with and to help folks as I can. And it reorientates myself towards what is most important in my life. And for me, you know, it's, it's relationship and creating safety and security around the people that I have the ability to do that for. For instance, for me, it's for my children, right? So we can't control the world. We can't control everything, but, there, but we have a sphere of influence. And, and so for me, that's crystallizing. That, that is a, um, a way that gives my life purpose and a glimmer of that sort of beauty and awe and mystery that comes when we look at these at these deep things. Thank you. Well, thank you for your deep share. I, I really appreciate um, you opening up about about that and and just and all of y'all feel free if you would like to connect to me after this talk i can share my email and 
one thing that I have a lot of is recommendations for resources. And so um, I'll be happy to, sh you know, if you email me at the email I just put in the chat, which is ryan at dreamstudies.org. Um, I've written about this material, but there's many, many folks who have know much more about this particular topic than, than I that I would that I can share with you. Yeah, thank you. So so isn't so here we are, right? So this is what dreaming does very quickly dreaming um, moves out of like, oh, my dreams are so weird to I'm dreaming about the most powerful encounter and relationships in my life and what's most important to me. And this happens every time. Because we dream about what's important to us. Um, and so for me, as a lucid dreamer, this is, is a call to how can I prepare myself to be as open as possible to what emerges in my creative life, in my dream life, and in my waking creative life? How can I not rationally shut down anomalous information based on my presumptions, assumptions, biases, right? How can I remain open to to this flux and flow of information and and beauty and love and relationships that is that makes our life what it is? And so lucid dreaming is a practice that can accentuate this. And the outcome is is that we will occasionally have dreams where we are self-aware. And we can essentially notice what's coming up and decide if we want to focus on it and decide if we want to go deeper into that rather than just making sort of that chronic or repetitive decision to look away when something is either unexpected or challenging or downright terrifying, right? That's the skill building that comes out of doing dream work and out of doing lucid dreaming. And this is why I came up with the lucid talisman, <laughs> because for me, um, as an ex-archaeologist, as someone who is deeply committed to, um, and I, I, I'd say that I'm, um, something happens with me with my relationship to physical objects. They, they, it helps make things real for me making a dream coin was a way for me to make real my commitment to the dream world. And what happened, I'll talk about this process as we move into this presentation, is that it, it became rapidly much more important than I thought. And in fact, like I never thought that when we made these first coins that it would end up with me writing a book on the topic and then, you know, moving into these spaces even further and deeper making a course on the topic as Angelo has talked about because I just opened up a, a beta course um, on this topic. And um, so if there's not, I, I want to just one last kind of moment. Is there something, is there something that you really feel like needs to be said um, that can't wait because we can address that? And if not, what I'll do is I'll move into my presentation. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands up. So, all right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna move into the presentation about the Lucid Talisman. Um, and about halfway through, we'll pause it and we'll do an activity. And we'll see how this goes. Oh, and before I begin, let's take a one minute break as I plug in my computer before it dies. That probably is the most essential thing. So one minute break, I'll be right back. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I had to do it. Hey, Pratiba, what's going on? It's nice here today. A nice day. It looks nice. The sun is shining. Yeah. People are saying hello. They do their park walks. That's a good idea. Uh, 
listen to <laughs> one of these new bar? Yeah. I like it. Thanks so much, Pratiba, for this. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And you can, of course, reach out to him and ask him more questions. And he's back now. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks, Don. Don. Yeah, thanks for that. Thank um, you. <laughs> I'm I'm um, staying with a friend right now in their cabin in the mountains. And so anyway, we kind of pulled this together at the last second here. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we will move into the presentation. And uh, yeah, feel you know, um, you take notes if that's good for your process. But do know that I can share the slides with you if you're interested later. So don't don't take don't take notes out of fear that you will lose the information. Okay, so you should now be seeing unlock the power of dreaming with talisman and amulets. So I'm going to take y'all into a little bit of a history plunge, and we're going to start with a little bit of inspiration with an image that comes out of the 16th century from H.C. Kunrath in this piece that was called the Alchemist's Laboratory. So this was a, a, an image depicting the work of an alchemist who was a medieval scientist and the science of alchemy was essentially a proto-science of creating valuable metals out of lead. So they were really looking to make gold out of lead. And because it was a proto-science, it was quite mystical. It involved astrology. It involved dream work. It involved uh, consciousness studies probably inebriations, we don't, we don't know, um, symbols, imagery, ritual, uh, beakers, you know, and so this is where modern chemistry came out of. In the process of alchemy was about transmuting lead into gold, and psychologically this is about the process of transmuting our base emotional I'd say our desires, our impulses into creativity, into wisdom, into achievement. And this is how it was depicted and discussed even uh, in the 16th, 17th century. So what we're going to do is we're going to, if you look at the image here, and there's so much going on that I can't even get into, but if you focus in on the back of the image, you'll see that there's a couple of pillars and a dormer and kind of looks like a, a passageway into a deep and so I'm going to use my um, Blade Runner technology here and say enhance. So we have just moved back into the deeper part of the image and what you see here is a curious Latin phrase. Dormian's Vigila which translates into a command to sleep with vigilance. What does this mean? It's a paradox, right? It's breaking through, I would say, a false dualism that sleep is about unconsciousness. And I wonder, is this also a reference to lucid dreaming, to the practice of lucid dreaming. Can we be asleep and be vigilant simultaneously? And vigilant to what? Right? What are we looking out for? Enhance. When you move even deeper, you see the door opening up to what appears to be the corner of a chamber perhaps the corner of a bed. Is this the alchemist's bed? Is this where he's taking his, his naps? 
I don't know. It could be something else completely. I've never heard anybody officially talk about this. Um, but I think it's interesting and it makes me curious. And that is how we'll start this discussion is with curiosity and <laughs> the unknown. So I want to talk a little bit about the origin story of the lucid talisman and how it came about as an amulet because um, it's kind of esoteric, as you might think. Uh, I, I got into it because a friend of mine makes coins for a living. He makes um, uh, custom coins, uh, usually uh, challenge tokens and things like that for the military, uh, other kinds of tokens for corporate use, uh, fan-based tokens. And he came to me and said, I want to make a dream coin and I said, oh, okay, well, I want to make a lucid dreaming coin. And uh, he's like, okay, well, let's design it. And so we did. We we very quickly like got some art together, and he minted 50 coins, um, our, our beta, basically. And we just passed them around. We passed them around to friends and to family. And what very quickly I realized was is that when I carried this coin around, um, that was sort of, you know, imbued with dreaming as just a concept is that I had better dream recall and I was begin having more lucid dreams. And I think the reason for this was is that I was using the coin as a way of asking myself, am I dreaming? And I was creating a cognitive loop. And we'll talk more about this, about this phenomena but essentially by asking this question i was stirring up the ability to ask this question in my dreaming life as well and so it, that was why we created the coin i was like oh this would be cool we call this a reality check we call this a reality check token they've been around since the 1980s there's i'm not the first one to make a dream coin of this nature uh, but something unexpected happened and what happened was is that the talisman spontaneously showed up in my dream and alerted me that this was a dream uh and and so i'm going to read the dream report here i'm outside near a group of people having um having a picnic we see suddenly i see the lucid coin i hadn't even named it at this point I see the lucid coin bouncing up and down in front of my face as if it's on a string. So it's just sitting here going kind of like this, bouncing. I look at it with curiosity for a moment, and then I realize, oh my gosh, I'm dreaming. And so that's basically when I knew that there was something more at work here than just a reality check token, that I was tripping into something that was ancient, which is the fact that when we begin to do this work, um, the coins take on a life of their own, right? So I want to give you um, just a really quick by the book definition of what an amulet is and how and how it works. This is a really ancient definition. And I like this um, because it's still accurate. It's still quite quite accurate. An object with letters and images and figures that have effects that help with celestial forces, right? And so it's it's magical in a sense. They can be painted, carved, they can be written, they can fall from the sky, they can be dug up, they can be discovered by chance, and they can be made from all kinds of different kinds of kinds of materials, right? Metals, paper, and stone. Um, the word um, the word, the thing about the amulet is that it is inherently magical. So it's like we find a stone and it's got these properties and we notice that, you know, it's like, oh, there's something going on here that's more than that this is just a rock. Like this is something special. It has this innate quality to it. And that's different technically than what a talisman is. You know, a ta what a talisman is, is an object that may be magical from the, from the outset or have some kind of specialness, but it's imbued with intentionality that we as the user add to it. And so a talisman essentially is a consecrated object. It's an object that we give special purpose beyond what it's already 
being used for. So it, you could say that talisman is a ritually enhanced amulet. That's historically where these terms come from, but today we use them sort of interchangeably, and that's actually fine. Um, as long as you kind of are clear on like, oh, like what makes this thing special? Is it the way that I'm using it? Or is there something, you know, innate about it that is powerful, right? So one of the first amulets that, uh, dream amulets that we have a record of are quite old from the seventh century from Syria. It's very small. If you can see this image, it's actually only like about six centimeters tall, right? And, and so it's this little tiny thing that's been very intricately carved. It was found in a household. And so it's in a, found in a household context. Um, and it's got all kinds of incantations written in it in Phoenician. Uh, and what they seem to be about essentially is an amulet for protecting against negative forces from entering the house. And so it is an amulet of protection. And so it's calling out to various gods, creating a covenant through these incant incantations. And it's specifically, it's mentioning certain kinds of, I would say, negative forces from entering the house, which is written on the, and translated as flyers and stranglers. These are the sort of the kinds of quote unquote demons that were associated, they were trying to keep out of the house. And here is a passage um, that is written from this. O flying one, in translation, O flying one from the dark room, pass away, Go now, night demons, from my house, you crushers, go away. And so what we learn from this is that this was an amulet to protect against negative forces, but ones that come in sleep, right? And so I think that this may be potentially one of the first examples of a amulet against nightmares and potentially against sleep paralysis nightmares. And so the sleep paralysis being the kind of a nightmare you have where you feel like you wake up and you can't move and you might have pressure on you. You might see or feel something malevolent. It can feel quite scary. These are a, this is a cross-cultural phenomena. It's called the incubus in some traditions. Today we call it sleep paralysis. We call it hypnagogic hallucinations. And so the strangler being the effect of feeling like there's something like a weight or a pressure on the throat. I, I believe that this is what is being referenced here in this very early amulet. Here's another example of an amulet of protection. This is the context is 19th century uh, Hebrew, it reads in translation, in the name of the angels of God of Israel, I conjure you all kinds of lilin, male and female, and demons, male and female, by the power of the holy name. And so lilin is, uh, you may have heard of the, of the goddess Lilith, uh, comes through the, the interfaith literature, comes through um, Old Testament and intertestament literature, really old tradition, but even in a pre-Christian tradition, in a context in Mesopotamia, Lilin is a night goddess, a demon that comes and, and basically snatches you at night, um, snatches babies, kills babies, um, impregnates women, um, has sex with men and makes, you know, demon babies, I guess. So this is, you know, all the lore that comes out of this that is still being carried forward in a 19th century context. So think about that. There, we've got a kind of continuity moving through the ages here. Please share the podcast if you have any more information on this stuff, because uh, there's, it's, it's so fascinating. I, don't want to talk too much more about sleep paralysis can kind of steal the show that's not where we're going today but i wanted you to see just some examples of this and now i want to show you a more sort of more positive example of how dream amulets are used 
This is an image um, of the dream boat uh, in Japanese tradition. This this came this image itself is 19th century, but the tradition is several centuries older. And it's depicting what's called the Hatsuyume. It's the first dream of the new year. And so in this tradition, folks would take this image or something like it and put it under their pillow in order to bring a good dream of the first year. And so they're not just hoping for a good dream, they're incubating a good dream. They're calling a dream. And what they're calling is they're looking for specific images to come into their dream life, which they will then interpret as, oh, this is going to be a year of abundance. This is going to be a year of prosperity, of good health, right? And so all these images here are all symbols for these kind of like, you know, these kind of effects. So this treasure boat, it's loaded with rice and keys and gems. Um, all this stuff. And, and interestingly, I think you can see it on sort of the left side. Yes, if you look to the right of the head of the dragon, there's a very cre curious creature that's brown. That is a creature that is called a baku, and it actually comes from a much earlier tradition out of China. It's known as the Nightmare Eater. And so the Nightmare Eater baku it's a, actually a form of a it's a, it's it's a magical horse it's a tapir it is it is now being translated into a much later context and is on the dream boat and so you've got this earlier you know dream amulet effect essentially keep the nightmares away eat the nightmares as well as calling forth good dreams calling forth images of abundance And here is probably an example of a dream amulet that, that you've seen before and you know well, right? From a modern or a post contact, um, cultural context, originally out of the Ojibwe nation and now considered pan Indian, pan Native American as a symbol of protection. The, the dream catcher catches bad dreams and also... Um, calls and catches the breeze and the wind of good dreams right and so it's sort of doing dual dual purpose there um, and um, just a quick note on people ask me about uh, cultural appropriation and I would say that you know native artisans love it when people buy their handcrafted dream catchers and you should support native artisans if you're attracted to and feel called to get a dream catcher to put in your bedroom. They are literally made for uh, non-native folks and as, as a gift, essentially, when they're made by artisans. Just don't buy them in the grocery or in the gas station <laughs> um, when they're made of plastic, uh, because those not the same. It's, it's not the same. So so I want to bring in a term, and I already mentioned this term before, but this is what this work is about, is about calling dreams or the process of incubation, to incubate a dream. A very old word, right? To, to um, the Latin means to, to lie upon, um, it, to sleep with, to sleep on it uh, is a way that we can kind of, kind of look at this concept today. And the process and the traditions surrounding dream incubation are vast and they're cross-cultural. It's only that we don't do it in the West, right? And so, but, but the West does have its older traditions as well that we can learn from as well as from indigenous traditions that still practice these things today. And one of them is the god Asclepius here. And this is... Uh, started off as a as a Greek god that later got um, um, the Ro Romans loved Asclepius was very popular for in the Roman era as well a god of healing as well as a god of dreams and Asclepius brought healing dreams in particular to those who are looking for healing 
looking for protection, um, especially looking for um, help with chronic and I, what we would today would call chronic pain and chronic conditions that that um, you know can't be solved by ordinary means, right? And so we still, in in a Western modern context, we still have problems with with these kind of things. Folks would go to sanctuaries, they would they would pray, they would rest, they would meditate, they would eat uh, clean, fresh foods, and cleanse, and then they would sleep to call dreams of Asclepius, to call dreams of his daughters, as well as certain images uh, that were interpreted as Asclepius, one of them being the snake. And you can see that there's a snake winding around his his staff there, right? That is the rod of Asclepius. And so the snake, um, in fact, what they would do is in, in ancient context in these Asclepians is that they, um, the priests would have snakes, non-poisonous snakes, um, colorful snakes, uh, wander around. They would put them into the sanctuaries as a symbol of Asclepius, and then people would dream about the snake, right? And so this is what we would call, you know, a moment of incubation, a moment of inception even. And so there's a lot going on in, in the cult of Asclepius that we can look at in a modern context and be like, wow, they're doing a lot of interesting things to bring good dreams. Uh, and so the big picture here is, is that we have to unlearn that dreaming is something that happens to us and rather that we have an active role in our experiences. Right. And so when we look to shift our perspective to, oh, I'm an actor here, it's not just happening to me. New things happen, new possibilities emerge. So just on a, a note of time, we're scheduled to go on for 20 more minutes. Um, and I'm going to go on for longer. I'm going to I'm going to give us some more time to make sure that we have time for discussion after this presentation. So if you need to go, not to worry. There's a recording, okay? And we'll make sure that the recording is available to you. Here's the other piece that comes through about dream amulets and how they're used cross culturally, is this concept of liminality, uh, that that an object exists in between worlds, right? I was just thinking about this. I wrote about this in a newsletter just yesterday, how cats, if you ever notice, if you, if you have cats, if you're a cat person, like when I open the, my window to, to let the cat out, the cat will sit on the windowsill and just sort of survey the scene from the windowsill, you know, as if like in its mind, it's a saber tooth, you know, tiger on the edge and the mouth of its cave, right? Surveying the landscape below. Um, but that's what's going on in a modern context with a house cat sitting in my windowsill. It's neither in nor out. It's in between. The cat becomes a liminal being in this way. And that's what amulets are, right? They harness this liminality that's what's special about them. We know that there's something special about this object and we give it intention and it becomes liminal when it shows up in our dream. It shows up in both worlds, right? And so, and so that's the way that I encourage you to think about when you're choosing an amulet is like, how can, you know, does, does this have that special power that it's going to show up in my dream life? And then to take this a step further, we can look at the practice of lucid dreaming as liminality as well, right? We are saying, hey, I'm awake in my dream. You know, it's a paradox of a sorts. It's a way of knowing. Um, we are in dialogue with the unknown. And so we're in between 
what we would say, oh, this is normally just a dream world. Now it's something more, it's something powerful. And we can use our attention and our choice to move into different spaces with lucid dreaming. And so lucid dreaming becomes, in a sense, a portal to other places as well. And so we can reframe lucid dreaming as a liminal zone that is enacted by ritual process, much like the ancient Greeks did as they were incubating healing dreams. It's a kind of dream incubation. We're incubating dreams that we're, I know that I'm dreaming, right? So it's not about content, like I wonder about a snake. It's rather, I'm going to know that I'm dreaming. So this is a very natural process and we've been doing it a very long time. And I say this because there's all kinds of just negativity sometimes when it comes to lucid dreaming about how it's uh, controlling the dream and um, repressing what really wants to occur. And I just think that that's all basically nonsense because people have been lucid dreaming in cultural contexts around the world for as long as we've been human, as far as we can tell. So you can kind of just forget about the garbage of controlling the dream because it really is just noise. And there's definitely, you can have that attitude. I'm not saying that you can't, but when we move beyond it, we move deeper, okay? Lucid dreaming is special because it's a liminal zone it, and, it, and it sees from an alchemical perspective, it's two ways of knowing. You've got that solar awareness of waking life, right? Of reason, of rationality, of being able to make choices to create order. And then you've got this intuitive way of knowing symbolized by the moon that is dreaming awareness. It's emotional, it's connected. It's very imaginal in the sense that images, um, you know, are powerful. Images are more than what they seem. So in a lucid dream, we are merging this solar awareness with that in this lunar landscape and creating something new. And this is a very glancing treatment of what alchemy is. Uh, but that's just the metaphor that I use in my book, and this is the metaphor of how we design the talisman, is to just think about how we are becoming you know, more lucid, not only in our dreams, uh, but in our waking life, right? And so the other side of the coin, literally, that we wrote, well, because we did put Dormian's Vigila on the lucid talisman, but on the other side, we put this curious phrase, lucide vive, which is an original kind of Latin construction to live with lucidity. And so in some sense, we can say this is the bigger work. The bigger work is we want to be more lucid in our waking life. We want to have more intuition and connectedness, right? Creativity, to be in the flow, to be open in our waking life because we're not very lucid we're not we're not lucid and so this is the practice and we're going to pause here and i want to make sure that for folks that do have to go early that they have time to do this activity so i want to explain a little bit more about this reality check concept about how do i know that i'm dreaming and um i'm going to stop the share here as well and so so the coin that we created was meant to be a way of easily finding something in your pocket where you can ask yourself, am I dreaming? And then how do I know? But there's other ways to go about it too. You don't need to lose a talisman to do that. Uh, but the practice itself involves two components. And those components are first, asking the question and taking seriously the question, am I dreaming right now? Am I dreaming? Now, you'll notice that you'll probably brush this off. And that's natural and normal and don't beat yourself up about it. Because some part of you is like, no, clearly I'm not dreaming right now, right? Like I, I, I know that I'm sitting watching a Zoom presentation and it is what it is. The practice is to stop that assumption and open yourself up in this moment to the question, am I dreaming right now? 
is this a dream? So you quickly move to the second part. How do I know that I'm dreaming or how do I know that I'm not dreaming? And this is where it gets complicated because we do a pretty good job of this in waking life. That is the definition of sanity. Okay. That's literally the definition of sanity, distinguishing waking life from dreams. However, in our dreams, we do a terrible job at this. And in our dreams, we'll ask this question and we'll assume that we're awake and that we're not dreaming. And we'll make this assumption in the dream itself because that's our cognitive habit. And we'll use really terrible methods that work okay in waking consensual reality, but don't work in the dream. And so what you wanna do is create a test for yourself in waking life that's foolproof in the dream that will catch uh, incongruity. Um, because what you think will work, won't work. Like looking around a room and saying, yeah, this is normal, everything looks cool. That's not a good reality check. Because in the dream, you'll do that and you'll make a nonsensical, like you'll be in your grandmother's house who passed away 30 years ago and you'll be in her living room. You say, oh yeah, I'm in my grandmother's house. Clearly I'm awake, this is normal. And you'll wake up and be like, oh, right, no. So, so there's only a few things that really, that dreamers have, have found that really work very well for creating this continuity and noticing discontinuities. And one of them is looking at text in your waking life and then looking away for a moment and even thinking about something else, like moving, shifting your attention to something else and then looking back at the text. In waking life, if you're sane, it's focused and clear and stays the same. And our working memory says, yeah, it's the same. In the dream, what more happens for most folks, more often than not, is you look at text, you'll look away, you'll look back at the text, and the text will have changed. The text shifts or it's not even there. But working memory is still good enough that you'll notice that there's a discontinu discontinuity. You'll say, oh, then something is different here. I'm dreaming, right? It's an odd thing, but that's really one of the best ones we've got. Here's another one that you can do. This one um, is harder to do as a practice in waking life, uh, say, because it's a little socially weird, but it works. And that is to hold your nose and try to breathe through your nose. When I do this in waking life, I, I can no longer breathe through my nose and I sound ridiculous, right? In a dream, when I hold my nose, I can still breathe because my dream hand has, is moved, but my waking body is still in, sleeping in bed and I'll be able to breathe fully. It's, it's a fantastic, almost foolproof way of testing reality. So when you do this practice in waking life, and you make a habit of it, and you do it 10 times a day, you're creating a cognitive loop that can basically move over into your dream life. That's what happens because we're very habitual creatures. And so if you think about something and you pattern your thinking on it, you're gonna, it's gonna pattern in your waking life too. Yeah, I see a question or a comment. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's me. me uh, can you hear, can you me, hear well? me well? Yeah. Okay, okay great. great. I think I it's think just on my mind. So my so question, question is regarding, regarding trauma, trauma and dreams. You know, you know they, they say from, from studies, studies that trauma, trauma can be like a blur, blur where a lot of people have memories because, because of the, the PMSD. So what's, so what's your, your info, info on that? that? How much of that can be safe after experiencing trauma and how much of it is the do you know anything, you know anything about, about Yeah, so a little bit. So ten, just tangentially, mm -hmm. um, I'll say that um, what makes PTSD trauma difficult in waking life is that people become unstuck in time. And they, you know, you lose your shoring. Um, you move into spaces, you move into imaginal spaces at... Um, 
in their emotional spaces as well, and they can't be controlled. And then in what happens in dreams for folks who have PTSD is they have repetitive, often almost exactly repetitive dreams of, of what, of where the trauma occurred. And so if it's a car accident, you keep reliving the car accident again and again. And so they're a special kind of nightmare and they're very difficult to work with in ordinary ways. Without going into a lot more detail about this, I can say that working with an amulet is very good for PTSD. Uh, and people who have ever been in AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, have seen this trick before because your token or your amulet can have a grounding influence in waking life and it can, and it can put you back in the here and now. And so if you have an amulet or an object in your pocket and you find yourself disassociating, making contact with an amulet, especially one that that is connected to feelings of, of power or of safety or comfort or religious, spiritual nature can be grounding. And you can pair that with a breathing exercise, for example, like one that Ian did at the beginning of our call today and get back into your body. And that's one thing somatically that's, that's very effective um, for PTSD trauma. And at the same time, it also reinforces this protective nature of the amulet that can then move over into the dreamscape. And so that's one thing that's really interesting about this. And there's so much more we need to know and learn about, about PTSD nightmares and how they're different and how to treat them without just zonking folks out on um, antidepressants, which is typical and not always effective, is that these ritual practices can really have a grounding influence. Thank you, Thank for, you that. for that. There's, There's something, something I know, I know about, about in spirituality, spirituality called the purple, purple plate. plate. Uh, so, uh, so it's not, not what you what have, have, but um, it's for it's chronic, chronic illness. illness. One, of One of my former coaches had told, told me about it, about it and it helped with chronic, chronic illness, illness by sharing that and, 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 and placing it on the air of the body to feel. He was a basketball player, but he had a lot of injuries. And I'm sorry if you sound funny. The audio is funny on my end. It's like I'm hearing myself so no oh, it's fine yeah, something something called called purple. Purple. that's great i i never and heard of that that's yeah, yeah so yeah. so the, and yeah there's and if you look into yeah I've, I've really seen some really excellent workbooks on ptsd that talk about these that these effects so there's there's clinical uh you know value behind this um it's it's real it's 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 truly healing and so yeah if you need to go early thank you for attending and and don't worry you'll be able to catch up with the recording so I have a um, an activity that I thought would be fun for us to, to do at this point, um, which is a reality check activity that you can do wherever you're at right now. And it's also a, an activity that highlights the liminality of our own space, our own, the architecture of where we live or work. And so the practice is, and this is the invitation that we'll do right now, is to, is to we'll step away from our computers and I invite you to walk through a doorway with the thought, am I dreaming? Now, if you're outside and you're no doorways around, try it going under a tree branch or something like that. You know, create some, find some kind of space that's like a portal. Uh, but the point is, is to, is to move through a threshold with this question of, you know, am I dreaming right now and try one of these practices of, of how do I know, how do I know that I'm dreaming? Another one that I didn't mention that works for a lot of people, by the way, is to ask how am I, okay, am I dreaming? And then to do a little jump because sometimes in a dream, what happens is we start to fly or float that gravity doesn't really work the way that it normally does. And so if you, if you know what it's normally like for you to do a little hop, you could try that because that's something that, that doesn't work well in a dream. So here's my invitation. We'll take, we'll take 
four minutes, all right? It's gonna be a quick one. I just want you to try this activity and see what it's like to be, and to notice as well, to attend to how your consciousness changes or shifts as you move from one space into another. So as you move through the threshold, after you've made this question, like how is your consciousness being shifted or changed by this new space, okay? So we'll come back uh, at 33, let's call it 34 minutes after the hour. Good luck. Welcome back. How um, how was that? How was that experience? Did, did anyone have uh, something they would like to share about about trying that activity? You can just unmute yourself. Well, well, I'm. I'm... Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm getting, getting an, echo. an echo. Are you getting, Are you getting my? my... An echo. An echo. Uh, you, you sound okay to me, Walter. Okay. okay. Well, well, I I'm, I'm sitting, sitting in my, in my work, work area, area. And when, and when I, I went, went through, through the, the threshold, threshold to, the to the hallway, hallway uh, I, felt I felt lighter, lighter almost, almost ethereal. ethereal. And. and then when, then I, when came I came back, back I felt, I felt heavier. heavier. <laughs> huh. <laughs> Interesting. So do you do you think that it was coming back into the office space itself? There's something about that space that feels heavier, or is it? Yeah, this, is this is where, where I, I do, do my, my serious, serious work. work, and, and I'm, I'm thinking, thinking of. of Big, big ideas, ideas. You, know, you know, and, and this, this is, is where, where I have, I have to, get to get things, things done. done. And the, and hallway, the hallway is a release, release from, that. from that, going, going out. out. I'm, I'm getting, getting away, away from, from it. it. I'm, I'm letting, letting it, go. it go. Nice, nice. Yeah, mm -hmm. nice observations. And so it really, it really shows how the architecture of our, of our spaces hold our awareness and shift shift what's possible, what we think about, what's important, what needs to be done. Yeah, anyone else have an experience yeah. like that, noticing a, a, a shift of that nature? Um, um, I, I definitely noticed a shift. It's like, it's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just jump, in. jump I, in. I just, I just, I just, I just, I don't know why that, why that, there's an echo, there's an echo in my part. Part. Yeah, anyway, anyway. everyone Everyone looks like they're muted at this point. Um, I'll mute myself in case it's coming from me. Yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll just, real quick, I, I just like, I jumped through, I jumped through in from one space to another. And, um, you know, it was definitely, um, I mean, basically I jumped onto a, I'm in a hotel and there's a balcony, right? So I jumped from the room to the balcony, not, not onto the floor or anything, but, and... <laughs> And it was it was interesting, you know. It's like it was it was like I was moving from one place to another, and it was almost like a shock of awareness kind of thing. I've moved into another space. I've got a different perspective. It was noticeable. Cool. Thank thanks for that. Um, right. So yeah, <laughs> it's it's a powerful exercise, and it shows. It shows a couple of things, right? It shows the power of space and, and how it trains and constrains and even amplifies our awareness, right? That's why we pray in cathedrals and not like, you know, on the toilet, right? I mean, space confines and transforms what's possible uh, and thresholds and doorways are liminal spaces because they are in between. Uh, and so noticing that in-betweenness is kind of the hard part. And I say it, it takes a lot of work to notice that. But that's a skill in itself, I would say. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. Uh, I don't see, hold on, let me see. Is there anyone else who's got something to say? I don't see anyone else has their hands raised. Um, so, yeah, we'll move on. Well, this is an activity that you can do um, as a reality check. And it's difficult. 
Try try to do it. Try to do a reality check every time you go underneath the doorway <laughs> for a day. You'll I will, okay. I'm a, I'll I'll go ahead and tell you. You will fail. <laughs> you won't notice. You won't notice all the doorways. You it's it's shocking actually how unaware we are of how our consciousness shifts as we move through spaces and time. But this is a window into uh, how malleable our awareness is and how we can use the knowledge of that to create spaces and rituals and activities that give us focus, right? And so that's what having an amulet essentially does. And, you know, what I, I would say is that um, just because we're, we're already moving late in the, in the late spaces, you know, for a practical perspective, the, having an amulet does this ability of making reality checks possible. Like if you have, for instance, if you have a talisman, the text is actually written on the coin itself in my dreaming. Um, but any kind of dream amulet can have, you can make that association, you can create an anchor with it. So if you have a stone or an object or something that you want to use as a dream amulet, you can make that association and look at it and gaze upon it as you ask the question, am I dreaming right now? How do I know? How do I know that I'm not? And do the practice. And if you do that 10 to 15 times a day, and it's kind of a long game, I have to admit, as a practice goes, you have to try it for a couple of weeks in a row to really get it to go. And so if you can make that commitment and try that, you'll 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 notice some shifts and you'll have a very good likelihood of having a lucid dream, especially if you have a strong intention about why you want to be lucid in the first place. And I don't have time to really get a move into that, but why do you want to be lucid? Why? Do you want to become more self-aware in your dream? Like, what's the motivating factor behind that? What are you looking for? What are you looking to experience? You know, what will you do tonight when you have a lucid dream? What's next? What's my first move now that I'm lucid? Am I going to fly? Am I going to, you know, seek out a character and ask them what's the nature of reality? You know, I, you know, right. So what's the next move? And so knowing that intentionality is really is, is really important when working with ritual objects as well as working with dreams. All right. And we've talked about the amulet as a protective, having a protective effect and a grounding effect during the day, um, but also a protective effect in the sense of like 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 dream catchers. You can imbue a, a coin or an object with prayer with um, intentionality and you can put it on your bedside table and it can hold the space for you and so if you're prone to nightmares or if it's a super stressful time and you need more support you can create an amulet for that purpose and have it actively sit on your bedside table and as a liminal object it holds the space even when you're asleep and you'll wake up in the middle of the night and you'll remember it's it's shocking actually how quickly you'll remember that that object is there before you remember anything else the object shows up in waking life in that liminal space of in between waking and dreaming right and so these are the things that dream amulets do and then and then hopefully they will incept themselves they will energetically show up spontaneously into your dreams like the like the talisman did for me when I was first experimenting with it, and I'm I'm seeing this talisman bouncing up and down on a string, and I and I realize oh this is a dream, and so we're inserting bizarreness and intentionality, we're anchoring it to a image or an object, and that image spontaneously shows up, right? Yeah, Angelo. You know, um, you know um, I, I asked you this. Um you know, in the podcast, but I think it's it's useful to ask again. Yeah, you know, we've been talking about lucid dreams, but I want to ask the question, why lucid dreams? Why should we why should we even want to do this? Right. That is the question. And and once again, this is an unanswerable question for me to answer. Uh, but folks have used lucid dreaming 
um, for purposes that run the gamut for centuries. Um, I'm interested in it from, if you look at it from a spiritual perspective, or a, a, I'd say a spiritual psychological perspective, it falls roughly into the buckets of, of what shamanism is useful for, which is for gaining information, for gaining power, right, or intention, or for healing, right? And so those are just sort of three simple kind of buckets um, that you can use lucid dreaming for, for enhancing an experience. And so people often are deeply motivated in a lucid dream, for instance, to, um, to face a fear that they know is debilitating them in waking life. Um, and so you can face that fear and you can ask that, that person or that object or that situation, what, what is this about? What do you need? What can I do? Or you can do it. You can take some power and change your relationship. Um, some people love to explore and just be in the dream space. And it's for, cre it's for creativity. It's for just inspiration, for awe, for experiencing, you know, something unique. Um, folks meditate in their lucid dreams. And they have profound non-dual experiences. And so, and of course, there's entire traditions, religious traditions like Tibetan Buddhism that uses dreaming as a path to enlightenment, right? And so from a Western perspective, um, we're often told that we can do anything. Uh, and that's a little, I think, weird um, because there are constraints to experience and possibility. But the question to ask yourself is, is that, you know, what am I looking for in my life? What do I want, have? What do I need more of or less of? Like, what's my focus? What, what can I use guidance on or energy for or courage about? Like, these are some good intentional kind of questions for your whole creative spiritual self that dream incubation can help with and then lucid dreaming in particular as knowing your dreaming can help with even even further. And so, yeah, it runs the gamut. And so with Thank that, you. Um, I want to just invite y'all, if, if you have an amulet with you, if you wanted to quickly um, do a show and tell and, 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 and show what you've got and, and um, Doing so can can be helpful, kind of for for socially cementing and giving some power, and some um, potential for for this object. Does anyone did anyone bring something with them? I see Bill's holding something up. What you got, Bill? Um, this is a a Japanese amulet for uh, healing for health, and when my son went uh, back to Japan recently. Um, he brought it back with him for me. And that was his present that he gave to me. Are you, planning, hear you, Ryan. To use, are you planning to use this for for dreams now that I, I would like I would to like to. Great, great. And so my recommendation would be to make it active is to is to just only to only use that for dreams for the next period of time and to think of it only in that relationship um, and to sort of focus its power and energy and to have a question, one of these intentional questions to use that um, that this amulet can help you with. Anyone else have a, a, oh, Walter's got something. Or Walter's got a talisman. <laughs> it looks like one of the old ones, Walter. Hold on, you're, you're muted. I'm gonna, I'm, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, my, my first IASD conference in, in 2015 and uh, uh, Virginia Beach, uh, uh, 
I, uh, a drawing was made for the newcomers and, and one of the prizes was uh, your talisman. <laughs> so I've had this and I'm just realizing now when I said earlier that I've been having shorter dreams and, you know, faster dreams. I realize I've been carrying this around with me every place I go. And for the past uh, few months, I haven't done that. And I was wondering if that's not why I'm having those shorter dreams and not remembering as many. It's telling me it wants me to keep it. <laughs> so I'm reconnecting with it. Uh, that's really that's really great. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, you've got one of the original coins. We've completely changed how we produce them at this point. You've got probably one of probably one of maybe three hundred or so of um, of that type. So it's actually quite rare. So yeah, that's cool. Yeah, well, hopefully this class will help you like create some some action and uh, try putting it you know by your bedside um and and let it have an active role as you're shifting into sleep thank you thank that's you. a great that's idea a great idea nice any anyone else uh we've got time for one more share i'd say Well, I'm reluctant well, to be the I'm last person, to but I'm going to jump in, so I'll jump in, which is sort of what I do anyway. Um, this is, I, I'm not at home, right? I'm I'm, in a, I'm in a different country, and um, so my my Ryan Hurd lucid talisman is back where I live. But um, for, for for the purposes of this trip, I have this, this object, which is used basically to, um, you know, activate paying for laundry. And I would like to use this um, tempor temporarily as, um, you know, a lucid talisman. Perhaps that's blasphemy or something. I'm a little afraid that it will it'll go off on the airport or something. But anyway. It's not blasphemy. That's great. You know, and that's part of it. You know, maybe the bizarreness of 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 that object being used in a new way will will be effective. I mean, that's that's going to be that's going to be interesting to see. Um, the best the best objects to incept that move into the dream world that are liminal objects are ones that are slightly bizarre or used in a slightly bizarre way. You know, so that's why um, something arcane um, or old, you know if we carry it around in, in a modern context, it's jarring. It like we noticed how it's different than like our iPhone, for instance, right? Um, an iPhone, for instance, would make a terrible amulet because we use it for too many purposes. Um, we can't focus our energy on a, on a, on a smartphone uh, to, to have it emerge in a, in a, in a meaningful way in a dream. Uh, but, you know, look for natural objects too, you know, like um, see what shows up. If you put the intention out and, you know, for a couple of days, really, to see, give yourself a couple of days as you wander about and see if a special stone shows up. Um, or it could be you're at the beach and it's a weather, you know, a wave worn piece of wood or something of that nature. Um, what emerges and, and, and reveals itself to you can be really synchronistic and and the finding of the amulet uh, can be a part of its power itself. And so that is some, some practices, as I would say. And before we go, I do have one link that I'd like to share with you of, a, of an easy way <clears throat> to do a dream amulet. Let me see, here's the link. This is a printable dream amulet. And so when you click this link, it should download a PDF for you that you can print. And you, you basically, you draw what is it you're looking for to dream about, to bring into your life, to bring into your dreams. And you tuck it, fold it, put it under your pillow. 
like as if in the Japanese tradition of Hatsumi, right? So you're doing, you're, you're literally sleeping on it. Uh, and so, so this is a good way to move into, to, easy way to move into intentional dream sharing of that nature. So, um, yeah, we, so we've got seven minutes to the top of the hour and I, I let's take the time for some last, last questions um and thoughts and um and then we'll part it part at the top of the hour what's coming up for y'all thanks for your attention thanks for giving me letting me talk about something that i'd love to talk about uh, i'll just say this is very 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 exciting, exciting for me um and um this gives me a um kind of a boost to um to explore this further and um, uh, thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, you're welcome. Absolutely. Take care, Walter. Okay. okay. Thanks, Thanks, Ryan. Ryan. You bet. Been, 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 a, been a great, great time. time. Yeah, I'm glad you could make it. Um, I actually have one more download for you. Let me see if I can find it. This one is an excerpt from my book, Lucid Talisman, and it's the chapter on how to activate your amulet. And so what other object you find when you find it, um, here are some practices for focusing its power and how to use it essentially ritually. Um, for cleansing it, starting with the process of cleansing, um, using smoke or water or salt. And then if you want to go deeper into anchoring it and then even consecrating it, which is a ritual process where it basically becomes, you know, where you, if you're into ritual, if you are into prayer or mantra, this could be an effective practice to do to really focus your intentionality and your power for using this amulet. And so, uh, so I, I hope that's useful. Um, this has been great for me. I, uh, I love talking about this and it, it's, it's, you know, um, different every time because, because what you bring to the circle always, uh, you know, it shifts what I'm going to talk about because that's and that's the nature of dreams in general is, is is that we come together and we begin to dream together we we create a space and dreaming holds that space for us 